So, oh, okay, 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 now it's fine. All right, the recording has just started. Sorry about the delay. Um, I'm not sure what the problem is, but the recording has just started. Let's um, pray together and then we will get started in our class today. May I request somebody to kindly unmute your mic and pray with all of us, please? So we can start. I would like to pray. Yeah, pray. Yeah. Please go ahead, Harrison. Father, we thank you. We bless your name. And we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the adoration. We thank you for another privilege. We thank you for another opportunity you've given unto us to study at your feet. This mm. morning, this minute, this hour, this moment. Mm. And we're asking Holy Spirit that you open our minds to receive the words that we're about to hear. And we're praying that you will reveal Jesus to us. Yes. That we may know him better and serve him better. We thank you, O oh God, that the words of God we're going to hear today shall not be words of men, but words from the throne of grace. We ask, O God, that at the end of this class, Father, we shall not just be hearers of this word, mm. but, Father, we shall also be doers of this word. Thank you, Father, because we know at the end, O God, we'll have every cause to glorify your name. Be thou exalted. For in Jesus' much less name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Harrison. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the class BC214, Developing the Human Spirit. I hope all of you had a good weekend, good time of uh, worship and fellowship at your uh, respective um, local churches and had a good time of fellowship. And thank you for joining the class today. Okay, um, we are going to step up on speed um, because we have only one hour a week on this class and um, and there's a lot of ground uh, we need to cover in this course on um, developing the human spirit. I'm going to go ahead and share the PDF and we'll just quickly review ground that we have already covered and then we will uh, take things forward. So in our introduction, we began by saying that we are tripart beings, spirit, soul, and body. And uh, then we, last week, we emphasized that because God is spirit, our primary interactions with him are, is through our spirit, or it's a spirit to spirit. That means the human spirit interacting with God over spirit. But one of the things I want to encourage all of us is to learn to see ourselves as a spiritual person, as a spiritual being. So from today, and some of you have already done it, but for the rest of us, from today, all of us, when you think about yourself, Think about yourself as a spiritual being. You're a spiritual person. I mean, not, not in the sense of interested in spiritual things, but you are a spiritual being. That's who you really are. And you have a soul and a body to live in this world. Right? So the soul on the body um, is the apparatus um, that, you, that you and I use to live in this natural world, but we are actually spiritual beings. And so as spiritual beings, first and foremost, our goal is to learn to interact with God who is spirit. And we also saw from Romans 1 and verse 9, we serve God with our spirit. So ministry is really a spiritual expression. It's, an ex it's a work of our human spirit. So, you know, it's what the human spirit is doing, of course, we have to use our mind, which is the soul part of us. And we have to use our body, 
you know, people have to see and hear us physically. Uh, but ministry is the is a work of our spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Of course, we will get to those those elements. So we start went back from you know the time we are born, and we said, look, uh, we can say clearly that um, there is this um, stage of innocence. Uh, this time, you know, we don't know exactly the age that is, but somewhere before we understand right and wrong, uh, before the law comes, the recognition of the law comes, there is, we are alive to God. So as children, by default, the, our human spirit is alive to God. And it, you know, but then slowly there comes this understanding of right and wrong, and then comes that's the time you you and I are held accountable for sin, right? Uh, because we have saw from Romans seven seven through ten, Paul saying, you know, when the law came, that is an understanding of right and wrong came, sin came, because now I'm responsible. And for those who don't have the law, we said, you know, uh, Romans two fifteen, there is the law of God embedded in the human spirit, which is the conscience. And we will talk about the conscience as well a little later. So uh, whether we understand the law as in, you know, through the, the word of God, for some of us, that's how it would have started. But for some of us, maybe in the initial years, you know, we had no exposure to the Bible or anything like that, but we had a conscience, which was the law of God written in our hearts. And that's there for every person. So there comes this recognition of right and wrong. And from that moment on, we are held accountable because sin comes into play, right? And so we talked about that. Now, from what Paul said was, when sin came, death came. That means that's the point. We realize, Romans 5.12, that through one man, sin came into this world, as Adam, Adam, and death through sin, and then death passed on all. That means every person by default comes into this place of being dead, unless of course you're born again before that. Death passed on all men for all have sinned, right? So that's Romans 5.12. So this is the default progression, you know, from a stage of innocence, we come to the understanding of right and wrong, and therefore now we are held responsible for sin, and with sin comes death. So by default, death passes to all men. And it's not that you and I are reaping of Adam's sin in one sense. Yeah, Adam was the first person to sin, but every person, every human person is held responsible for their own sin. It's not like we are paying for Adam's sin. No. Adam's sin, death came in. But all of us have sinned personally. And death passes on to all of us. Okay, that's, that's, you know, at that early stage, uh, when we come out of that stage of innocence and cross over to the understanding of right and wrong, the law of God, that sin comes and then because of sin, death. So what is the default state of the human spirit? Right? That, um, that Now, I, I'm talking about someone who's not born again. Right? If somebody gets born again, then the life is different. Right? We'll come to that. But let's just go in this usual default path. Right? Now, some, some people have um, the opportunity of being born again as little children, and that's wonderful. You know, and uh, uh, especially in churches today uh, where uh, we can, you know, we have children's church and we're able to ch teach children very early uh, about, uh, share, tell them about the gospel and they're able to, you know, uh, make a decision. Uh, so, you know, somebody when they are six years or eight years or 10 years of age um, uh, could understand the gospel and give their life to Christ and be born again. Wonderful. Uh, but let's assume that the progression is stage of innocence. They haven't heard the gospel. Um, therefore, now they come into this place where the 
person is accountable to sin, the human spirit, what is the condition of that human spirit? Right? So we will look at two passages here in Ephesians 2. Let's go there, please. In Ephesians 2, um, verses 1, to 3, 1, 2, and 3. So this is the default condition of the human spirit. Right? So that means I, before I was born again, this was my condition. And that's true for all of us. Before we were born again, what was the condition of the human spirit or what was my spiritual condition? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Could somebody read that for us, please? Ephesians 2, 1, 2, and 3. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Mm, thank mm. you. Thank you, Sandra. So this is, he's talking about us before we were born again. So what do we see here? Verse one, we were dead in trespasses and sins. So when it says death, it doesn't mean the human spirit was not existing, right? Our human spirit was there. It had the, uh, it had a fact, it had its faculties, which we will be looking at. Uh, and it had its uh, functions, which also we'll be looking at. So we'll talk about the five faculties of the human spirit and the seven functions of the human spirit. So it had its, its faculties and functions were there. So when it says we were dead in sin, it doesn't mean the human spirit ceased to exist. No, we were alive in, in the meaning the human spirit was active. But death here is, as we will see in Ephesians 4, it is the absence of the life of God. So our human spirit was without the life of God. And it was in sin. And not only was it was the human spirit in sin, verse 2 says, we lived, so this is a manner of life, we walk according to the ways of the world. But why were we walking according to the course of the world? It says, we were walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. So look at that very carefully. The course of the world, that means the ways of the world. It says we were walking according to the ways of the world. And then it says we are walking according to the prince of the powers of the air. It means we were actually walking according to or in alignment with demonic um, Satan and his demons or you know, basically the kingdom of darkness. And it says the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. That means our whole life, our human spirit was under the influence of darkness, the kingdom of darkness. And it's literally saying the spirit there was demonic influence, right? Spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. That means we were under the influence of the domain of darkness, which is why we were walking according to the ways of the world. And verse three, and therefore, how did we conduct ourselves? We lived according to the lust of the flesh, and of the mind. That means we were body controlled. We were soul controlled. And by nature, we were children of wrath. So the very nature of the spirit. So now we begin to understand something. Our spirit person, the human person, the spirit person has a nature. I mean, by we say nature, you know, you're who you you're who you are, your nature. By nature, we were under 
the kingdom of darkness. We were, you know, destined for the wrath of God, the judgment of God. And because we were under the influence of darkness, we walked according to the course of this world. We were body ruled. We were soul ruled in the wrong sense, meaning we were do fulfilling the lusts of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So that's the life of a person who was not born again. And Paul continues this in chapter 4, if you'll turn with me to Ephesians 4. And we're going to look once again at, um, look at verses 7, 17 through 19. Could somebody read that for us, please? Shall I read it, sir? Please go ahead, Sister Rupa. Ephesians 4, chapter 17 to 19. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. Thank you. Mm, thank you. So, again, here he's talking about our life without God. What's he saying? He says, the Gentiles or the unsaved are walking in the futility of the mind. That means the mind is corrupt, is futile, is perverse. That means our way of thinking is wrong. And, and therefore, and not only that, our understanding is darkened. So our understanding of spiritual things is darkened. We don't understand the things of God. And we are alienated from the life of God. Verse 18, we are alienated, we are cut off from the life of God. So what is spiritual death? Spiritual death does not mean the human spirit doesn't exist. No, it's there. The human, so spiritual death simply means we are we don't have the life of God. So before we were born again, our human spirit was functioning. It had its faculties, it had its functions, but it had no life of God. It didn't have the Zoe, the word, the Greek there is Zoe, the Zoe life of God. It didn't have that. Uh, the eyes, uh, you know, it was darkened. It was in darkness. It didn't have the spiritual understanding and therefore we were living according to the desires of our minds. We were walking in spiritual ignorance, spiritually we were blinded. We didn't have the life of God. And we were actually influenced to various degrees by the kingdom of darkness. So that's the condition of the unregenerate or the person who's not born again. The, of, that's a condition of the human spirit, which is then controlled by the mind, which is perverse, which is, uh, you know, programmed or it's thinking along the ways of the world and the flesh or the body, which is satisfying all the unclean desires. But then, what happens? We get born again. What happens in, when we are born again? This human spirit is born from above. John chapter 3, verse 1 to 8. The human spirit receives life from God. So that's being born again. So the human spirit does not have the life of God. Like we see in Ephesians 4, 18, we are alienated from the life of God. That's, for, that's why we are dead. So spiritual death simply means the absence of the life of God. The lack of understanding, spiritual understanding of who God is. But when we are born again, we receive understanding of who Jesus Christ is. We embrace him as our savior. And the life of God is given to us. The Holy Spirit 
comes and dwells, dwells in us. So we are born of the Spirit. We are born of God. And to be born of God means his life and his nature is imparted to our human spirit. So literally, we could say that our, the DNA of the human spirit is changed. Before, by nature, we were children of darkness. When we are born again, by nature, we become children of God. Our very DNA changes. We receive life and the nature of God where in the human spirit. So the human spirit has nature, has DNA. Now if you talk in our natural terms, and the very nature of the human spirit is changed. You are born from above. We receive life and nature of God. And we become a new creation, a new man. And what is this new man? It's the life and the nature of God imparted to the human spirit. So 1 John 5, 1 says, you know, we are born of God. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. It's like God giving birth to you. So when God gives birth to you, his life, his nature, now is in your spirit. So to be born again, really, we are receiving the life and the nature of God. We are receiving Zoe, which is life and the nature of God given to our human spirit. So the human spirit now has received new DNA. It has received the life and the nature of God. But what is interesting is that the Bible is telling us that this, so when we are born again, it's almost like we are born as babies. I shouldn't say almost. We are born as spiritual babies. So the human spirit has been born again. So it is a fully functional human spirit, but it is born as a baby. So we are a new creation. It means that some God has, you know, God has done something in us that now we are born anew with the life and the nature of God. Now we can't fully explain it, and you are you and I are familiar. You know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you and I are, I are familiar about the conversation that Nicodemus had with Jesus in John three. He said, "You know, how can a man go back in his mother's womb and be born?" But Jesus says, "You know, um, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit." And he says, "The wind blows where it." Once you can't tell where it comes from, where it's going, so is everyone who's born of the Spirit. In other words, you can't explain everything, but this born, being born of the Spirit is a real thing. And we, we can't explain that whole dynamics of what happens when the human spirit is born again. All we can say is the human spirit now receives the life and the nature of God. It's like the very DNA of our human spirit has changed. And now we are our spirit is born anew, but it is born as babies, as a baby, a spiritual baby. So now the human spirit, the born again human spirit has to grow. Right? So uh, we are familiar with these verses, but it's good to look at it. First Peter 2, 2. Can somebody read that for us, please? Shall I read first? Please go ahead. As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Amen. Mm. Yeah. So here Peter, the apostle Peter, is comparing spiritual life with natural life. So he says, as 
newborn babies. So he's saying, look, there's a comparison here. As newborn babies, you desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow. So which you he's talking about? He's talking about the human spirit, the born again human spirit. He's saying the born again human spirit has to grow just like is a comparison. He's saying just like newborn babies, the born again human spirit has to grow. That means it has to increase in, in various aspects of its life, character, and nature. It has to increase in that. So that is a growth, right? It's a development of the born again human spirit. So Second Peter 3.18, so it's like a baby, right? For instance, you know, uh, the baby that's born, it has all the features, uh, all, all the faculties of a human. Uh, it has all the functions there, or almost all the functions, uh, but the faculties and the functions have to be developed. Right? The baby can see, can hear, it can walk, I mean, eventually start walking and running, and all this, the faculties, uh, uh, the senses, the faculties, and the functions are there, but they have to be developed. So it's got everything to be a, a mature person, but it will, it has to grow and develop. And that is also true. Sorry about the noise here. I don't know if my mic is picking up the noise. Um, but that is also true about the human spirit. Right? So Second Peter 3 and verse 18. Can somebody read that? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. So he's saying grow. Again, Peter's once again saying grow in grace and knowledge. Now the word grace here can be understood as not only in the sense of God's favor of, that's endowed on our lives or the word grace also can be understood as divine empowerment but the word grace can also be understood as in virtues so grow in the virtues the character and in the knowledge in knowing so there is of our Lord Jesus Christ so there is this growth this development that has to take place in our spirit um, if you also go to first John chapter 2 uh, and uh, I just want to point this out to you in this passage, uh, verse 12 to 14, uh, John, uh, he's writing to the believers, and he is referring to some, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 to 14, to some he refers to them as little children, to some he refers to them as young men, and to some he refers to as fathers. Now, obviously, he's not referring to physical age. You know, he's not referring to little children. Uh, and he tells them, you know, your sins are forgiven. So it's not, uh, you know, that only, you know, physical babies have their sins forgiven. Uh, uh, and it's not, he's not expecting this letter to be read to physical babies. That's not the point. The point is, He's referring to different stages of spiritual development that he's recognizing among these believers. Some of them are like little children. Some of them are like young men. And some of them are like our fathers. That means they have matured spiritually. So if you, it's very interesting to little children, he's really assuring them of their forgiveness of sins uh, and, uh, and talking to them about knowing the father. Uh, to the young man, he is, uh, you know, um, commending them for their ability to overcome the wicked one. That means they're in that stage where they're living an overcoming life. And uh, to the fathers, he's saying, you look, now you have known him. You have known him who was from the beginning. I mean, they're now in this place of actually, you know, uh, knowing God in a very mature, very as mature people. So, 
you see the, the difference. Little children, emphasis on forgiveness and getting to know the Father. Young men are that stage of living the overcoming life. The Word of God is in you. You're overcoming. And fathers, you're established in knowing God. You know, So he's talking about different levels of spiritual growth. Right? So what I want us to understand is that all of us are in this progression of spiritual growth. He's talking about our, our human spirit. We have been born again. We have received the life and the nature of God. But we were born as babies in our spirit. And then that, that, that spiritual person is growing up, is developing. Right? And some of the areas that you know, we just mentioned here, that the whole course is about focusing on developing the human spirit. But some of the areas we can say uh, is, and we will come back to many of these things, uh, we, we will have to increase in revelation knowledge. That means in knowing spiritual things. Because before we were born again, our understanding was darkened. We read that in Ephesians 4, 18. Our under spiritual understanding was darkened. I mean, like we had zero knowledge of, you know, of, of spiritual things. Or maybe some people were involved in the dark side of spiritual things. So they understood a lot about darkness and so on. But about God, about who he is, about the things of the light, we were zero because we were spiritually in darkness. But now the spiritual man, the human spirit has to grow, increase in revelation knowledge. We also have to increase in our knowledge of the will of God, of knowing what is good and acceptable of knowing what is, you know, what is the will of God? So the spiritual man will come to a place where I know the will of God, right? It has to grow in knowing the will of God, right? Uh, the spiritual man has to become strong. That means you increase in strength, just like, you know, and as the child grows, okay, maybe it can lift a little, you know, little uh, light things and becomes a, bigger person can lift heavier things and then becomes a young adult can lift solid heavy things. So uh, our spiritual capacity of what we're able to carry, what we're able to do also increases, our spiritual strength increases. So like this, you know, there are many other areas of development that can and has to take place in the spirit. And that's what we want to focus on as we talk about in this course and, and, and talk about developing the human spirit. You know, we will be you know, coming back to many of these, look at many of these verses as we break things down further. But what I want to really impress on our heart, on our understanding today is you and I have received the life and the nature of God into our human spirit. That means the DNA is there. And what kind of DNA is there? The life and the nature of God. Right? This new man is created in the image of God, in righteousness and true holiness. In Ephesians 4.24. It's in righteousness and true holiness. So the DNA of God has been given. The life and the nature of God has been given to our human spirit. We are born again. But the human spirit, the born again human spirit, is like a baby living in this, you know, this external, the, 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 the mind and the body, this mind and the body. And the human spirit has to grow in many areas. Like we put, put listed down a few things in, in the knowledge of God, in knowing the will of God, in uh, spiritual capacity, it has to be developed. But now here's the challenge. Remember we read in Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 4, 
what was the condition before we were born again. It's pretty bad. We were under the influence of darkness. We were walking according to the course of this world. We were living according to the soul, the mind and the body. So we were soul ruled, body ruled. So now here we are born again. We are taken out of darkness, brought into light. So the prince of the power of the air can no longer or no longer has the authority to exert his influence on us because we've been taken out of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So spiritually belong to that kingdom, his kingdom. But we are still in this environment where we are surrounded by people who are walking according to the course of this world. And our soul and our body is still what it used to be. Our soul still used to, you know, uh, it has been programmed by default to the ways of this world. And our body has been programmed to the ways of this world. Our spirit has been born again, but the soul and the body has not changed. So the soul, that's why. So for the spirit to be able to, we are really spiritual beings. And the spirit, for the spirit to really come through, several things have to happen. The human spirit has to be developed the way God wants it to be developed. The soul, which is the mind, has to be renewed. The body has to be dealt with. It has to be crucified or brought in subjection to the spirit. So that's what has to happen. The spirit has to grow. The soul has to be renewed. The body has to be crucified and kept in subjection. Then the human spirit can exert its influence through the soul, through the body, and carry out the work of God. Now, if that does not happen, now this is a this is a process, and we're going to get into that as well. But if the human spirit, the born again human spirit, doesn't grow, what happens? The soul and the body still dominate. And that's where we have carnal Christians. That means they're born again, all right. But the soul and the body is still walking according to the course of this world, because that's what it's used to all the before. And the human spirit has not developed spiritually. They have not grown. The soul has not been renewed. The body has not been crucified. So what do we see on the outside? We see an expression of the soul and their body. And it looks just like the world. And so we still, and the Bible refers to them as carnal Christians. But that's a dangerous thing because it could destroy what God has started in the spirit. Because Paul says in Romans 8, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Right? So if, you, if we continue living flesh ruled according to the lust of the flesh and of the mind, that's according to the same what we read in Ephesians 2, he says eventually it will destroy the very life of God. So it's dangerous. Instead, we have to develop the spirit, renew the soul, crucify the body. So let me just say one or two more sentences and then we will take time for discussion. So the next thing we want to talk about is to um, understand the faculties of the human spirit. And then we want to talk about how God deals with the human spirit and 
what is the human spirit capable of in its interaction with the spiritual realm? And then we want to talk about developing the functions of the human spirit so that we know the goal is how do we grow spiritually and learn to interact with God in a very, very powerful way so that the spirit can dominate the soul, the body, and express the work of God the way he wants it. Okay. So let's pause here and I just want to open up some time for questions and discussion. Let's look. Um, Elisha. Elisha's question. In Africa, tradition it is beloved that the soul is something that's inherited from our earthly fathers. Could that be true? And does this have any scriptural evidence? In Africa, tradition is believed that the soul is something that's inherited from our earthly fathers. Could this be true? And does this have any scriptural evidence? So, every human being is an individual spirit being created by God. The soul is, uh, uh, again, unique to that individual. Right? In scripture, we do not see anything that uh, of the spirit or the soul coming or being inherited from the father, no, uh, the human ancestor. No, the spirit is uniquely created by God and given a soul and a body, right? It's uniquely formed by God for that individual. Now, of course, because of the upbringing and the environment, you know, the home that we are raised. Yeah, there'll be things that uh, we learn now uh, based on our upbringing, but those are acquired, not created, right? So we will learn the practices of the environment in which we grew up, the, according to the culture and the tradition. We learn those things. But according to the Bible, spirit, soul, body is unique for every person. Is that okay, Elisha? And let me try to answer the other questions. Um, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, Anita. Anita's question. Please explain that we have sinned. Um, I, I think you're referring to, um, you know, like what we were saying when we moved from the stage of innocence. So we come to this understanding of the law of God, right and wrong. And that's when, you know, we are responsible. That's when we sin. So this early stage, like Paul said in Romans 7, 7, uh, when he was alive without the law, that means before he knew right and wrong, right? He was alive to God. So that's the stage of innocence, uh, you know, as a child. But then when the knowledge of right and wrong came, whatever that, you know, age may be, the awareness that there is things acceptable to God and things not acceptable, I don't know, maybe age of six or whatever. People generally say it's age 12, but I think we understand God and right and wrong maybe a little earlier than that. Um, but anyway, whatever that age is, then that's, you know, he says, then with the understanding of the law came sin and with that came death. So God holds us responsible from that moment on. I hope I answered your question. I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly, um, but I hope I just answered it. Um, thank you. Charles. Pastor, I have a follow-up question on the uniqueness of the soul. Uh, sorry, sorry, say that again. 
I have a follow-up question on the uniqueness of the soul. Um, <clears throat> and I, I was inquiring if the soul is unique, um, is it that um, uh, when you are speaking, it was something that came in my mind and I was like, so the bodily attribute of the soul and its uniqueness can be seen like on the thumbprint, like you, you, someone is so unique in a way that it can be seen on the thumbprint that he is unique, he is alone, he is the only one, and he cannot come, he cannot be, he cannot give that inheritance to another person. That's what was coming in my brains, and I was thinking about it, and I wanted to inquire. Thank you. Um, that's a very interesting thought, and the answer is yes. You know, and this is the one, the greatness of our God, that even though there are so many billions of people, every person is to some way different from every other person. Right? We all have spirit, soul, and body, uh, yet none of us are copies. You know, uh, we are all different. And a very interesting observation. Yeah, you know, just by looking at the thumbprint or uh, the the eye, there's, there's so many things that are just different uh, among the billions of people. Uh, yeah, that's how great our God is, right? So let's go to the next question from Charles. Shed more light or speak again about the growth of the human spirit after being born again. Okay, uh, shed more light about the growth of the human spirit after being born again. Yeah, so uh, uh, at the moment we are born again by the Holy Spirit, by the word of God, which we hear when the gospel is preached to us, uh, God imparts his life and nature to the human spirit, right? So the human spirit has all the faculties and the functions, you know, but it's born, it has received the life into the nature of God and it is born spiritually as a baby in the things of God. And that's where the growth has to take place. So we have to grow spiritually. Like we said, uh, we've mentioned a few areas like in the knowledge of God and knowing who God is and so on in the things of God, we have to grow in our knowledge of the will of God, what is what is pleasing to God, what is not pleasing to God. Uh, we also have to grow in our strength, right? And just like uh, in the natural, you know, growth happens as you feed, as you exercise, as you rest. God has given to us things to develop our human spirit. You feed your human spirit and so on. So we'll talk about that, you know. How do you develop the human spirit? Uh, through the ways God has given to us in the Bible, okay? So that has to happen, and, and, and we, we can understand how that growth is supposed to take place. Um, I, I know I'm a little over time, uh, but I'm just trying to finish answering the questions before we go for a break. Uh, let's say, Christopher, uh, please explain the stage of innocence in the life of a believer, non-believer. Right, so the stage of innocence uh, can be what we know is uh, at that point, you know, as as children, you know, and and again, it's not like our understanding is everything, but we are innocent. We don't know right and wrong from a perspective of accountability to God. We may know right and wrong from what our parents told us. Parents will say, "Don't you know." Uh, don't throw your toys here or don't, uh, you know, whatever. You know, from that aspect, we know right and wrong from what our parents taught us, but we don't know yet right and wrong from a sense of accountability to God. Now what's pleasing to God, what's not pleasing to God. So that's why we say it's a stage of innocence. But at some point there's the recognition that there is God who created everything. And therefore I'm answerable to him more than being answerable to the adults around us. And that's when we are held accountable for sin. And 
you know, uh, whether it, so that stage of innocence is the same for all people, whether you're a believer or not a believer, because we are not born as believers, and neither are we born as non-believers. So at that stage, there is, you know, there is no believer or non-believer, it's just a child who is in that stage of innocence. But once we reach that stage of knowing, that's when we make a choice, right? We, um, by default, many of us would continue as non-believers, unsaved, until we give our life to Christ. Okay. I hope I answered your question. Uh, Pastor, just a follow-up question. Um, so how does this sort of uh, uh, relate to uh, the sin that is passed, you know, from from Adam to to uh, to uh, every person um, and because um, if that when is that actually passed and how does that sort of relate you know to the fact that you know we are we are we are in a sense innocent when that sin has already been passed to us yeah so that would come in at the point when we recognize what's pleasing to God, what's, you know, what's right and wrong. And we commit sin, right? I, I do, like, let's, let's say the child comes, you know, you know, it's a baby, not done anything, it's innocent. So God is not going to judge that child for, you know, you have sinned or you had an evil thought or what. No, it's innocent, right? And that the baby is growing now. At some point, there is, I, I, the, I, you know, the, the child does things right, wrong before God. That's their own sin. But that propensity to sin comes from Adam. Right? But the child is not being punished for Adam's sin, being punished for their own sin. And that's when death comes in, because one sin is enough for death. Right. So, um, I think your question was, when does that happen? So I would say, it happens at this at the point when the child has the ability to know that there is right and wrong, morality. Let me put it, use the word morality. Becomes aware of moral right and wrong. And therefore, when the child begins to engage what is wrong, that's morally unacceptable before God. Sin has come, death has come. But if the child dies before that example, it's killed in a war or whatever, dies before that, the child will go to heaven because it's not going to be, it's, it's, it's not, it hasn't morally sinned before God. So that child will be preserved and go to heaven. Okay. All right, now um, we have um, seeing a lot of questions. So let me try to answer everything. Hmm, I have four minutes. Um, Devia's question. In developing the human spirit, what is man's responsibility and what is God's role in bringing this about? So God makes the provision. He's given us his word. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He gives us the instruction how to do it. Uh, and then, he, of course, he gives us the grace to do it. That means he empowers us actually to do it. But then we have our part to play. Our will is involved. You know. So example, just very quickly mention this in, in Jude chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, Jude says, building up yourselves. Because you build yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That means you are responsible for building up yourself. And then the very next verse, verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. So God has given the love of God to me, but I have to keep myself in it. God has given me the Holy Spirit and the ability to pray in tongues, but I have to build myself up by using what God has given to me. So there is that, uh, you know, I don't know if, I, if it's right to put it like this, but there's equal responsibility. God makes the equipping available 
I have to do the practicing to develop the human spirit. Okay. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Next one, Elisha. Uh, which part of a human's faculty sin, soul or spirit? So sin is a spiritual thing. Okay. But our soul and our body are involved in the process. So sin is a spiritual thing. Something has gone wrong. It's an act of the human spirit. But our soul and our body are involved in the process. So, uh, so that's when we say deed, you know, example. I can commit, and a person, you know, can actually kill another person, that's murder. But the Bible also says, if you have hatred in your heart, you are a murderer. So, in the first case, there was action involved. There's a physical action involved. The body was involved. In the second case, it was just a spirit and soul involved. But in the eyes of God, both are murder. In the first case, spirit, soul, and body were involved because murder started in the heart. May, there may have been hatred or anger or whatever that resulted in the deed being committed. The actual somebody was killed. In the second case, it's only spirit and soul involved, meaning there was hatred in the heart and for whatever reason, maybe, you know, he got into an argument or whatever, but there's hatred in the heart, nothing physical committed, but if you have hatred in the heart, you're, you're a murderer. In the eyes of God, both people are murderers. So sin is spiritual, is expressed to the soul and the body. Is it okay, Elisha? Yes, uh, Pastor Isaac, um, can I ask a follow-up question? Um, okay, okay. Um, at death, the, the soul and the spirit is separated from the body. And physical death is as a result of sin. So we, we, we can take it that physical death, the decay of the human body, is as a result of the punishment of sin. Now, um, with the spirit and the soul, the spirit is the origin of sin, the soul partakes of it. And why is it that is it this, is the soul that the Bible says the soul that sins uh, shall die? Can, mm -hmm. I, can you explain that to me? Mm -hmm. Why the spirit doesn't go through any punishment, but the soul rather? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, we have to understand the usage of the word soul. And uh, I think I've shared this in the notes that the word soul by default does talk about the, you know, what we refer to as a mind, will and emotions, but it's not exclusively used for that. The word soul um, uh, uh, is also used to talk about the life principle, the very life of the being. So when God says the soul that sins, he's not talking just about the mind, will, and emotions. He's talking about the person, you know, the entire person. So, for, for example, Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? So in the New Testament, that word soul, in, in that usage in Mark A, he's not just talking about mind, will, and emotions. He's talking about the whole inner person. So, so we have to understand it in the context. So when God says in the Old Testament, the soul that sins, it shall die, he's not just referring to mind, will, and emotions as a compartment, but he's referring to the whole person, it, spirit and soul, clubbed together. You pay the punishment. So it has to be understood in the context because the word soul is used, you know, in, 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 while we primarily understand it as the emotional part of us, it's not exclusively used that way in both Old and New Testaments. Is it okay? And in the end of chapter one, I've kind of given that list of things you can look up. Okay, okay, Pastor. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. All right, we're already into the time for the next class. Uh, let me try to. 
uh, Prabhakar. Please, some more details on the faculty and functions given to us by God. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to get into that, Prabhakar. We're going to look at the five faculties of the human spirit and the seven functions of the human spirit, right? So that um, the chapter is coming up and we will talk about it. So basically the human spirit, the real person, has a parallel faculty, like can see, can hear, can feel, can taste, can smell, so on, spiritual, in the spiritual things. And then we have seven functions. Then it's what the human spirit is able to do. So conscience is one of them, knowledge is one of them, uh, action is one of those functions. So the human spirit is capable of these things. And so we want to develop our faculties and our functions. And we're going to learn how to develop those things. Okay, so that's coming up. Uh, Elisha, does the stage of innocence excuse anyone from judgment? Yeah, so we answered that, that if the child dies, God is not going to send the child to hell because it was in that stage of innocence. It didn't have, it didn't reach that stage of knowing God, stage of morality and uh, being held accountable for sin. Okay, and last one, Kennedy, how does territorial spirit affect our human spirit? Yeah, so that's interesting. We're going to talk about that. Uh, what we have seen so far in Ephesians 2 is the prince, we were walking according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the spirit of disobedience that works, uh, according to the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So what Ephesians 2 is telling us is there is this demonic influence on the individual, right? So into that sense, every individual is... I mean, every unsaved person is influenced by what the prince of the power of the air is doing in that region. And it is also, influ and so as believers, we are also exposed to that. I'm not saying we are subject to it, but we're exposed to it because we're living in this world. But we will come to that in another chapter when we say, you know, our interactions with the spiritual realm. There's a good side to it. That means when we in, our, our, when we engage with God, you know, our spirit, soul, and body is blessed. But uh, if we expose ourselves to the prince of the power of the air that works now in the children's disobedience, you know, we don't want that. But that can influence us to uh, certain degrees, and we have to be careful. Last question from Sri Kumar, and then we will wrap this up. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, um, I just want to know um, now, as we are discussing on on believers, um, what in what in case of unbelievers, where it says that Romans chapter two, where it says the Gentiles which have not law, do by the nature of the things contained in the law. So, um, as it is written that their God has given them a, that their inner man a law. So, in that case, if um, just a, 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 like we have this, um, you know, uh, a common understanding that almost every Gentile will go to hell with, because they are not without Jesus. But uh, in case if a Gentile, as per this word, if they, if they are, if they live a life, if they lived a life without knowing Jesus and they lived a life um, according to the law, so can they have the access, their spirit can have the access to get into heaven without Jesus? Oh, okay. So if you look in that same chapter in Romans chapter 2, where in Romans 2.15, Paul says, you know, the unsaved, they have the law of God, the conscience, the law of God written in their hearts, which is the conscience. But he goes on in that same chapter and he says in the very next verse, he says, God will judge the secrets of men's hearts by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So that means... Even though, so in Romans 2.15, even though the law of God is written in their hearts and they've been given the conscience, how will they be judged? Romans 2.16, according to the gospel. So the answer is, they will be judged according to the gospel. And what does the gospel say? He who believes is saved and he who does not believe will not be saved. Right? So the answer is no. Even if they live just by their conscience, they're going to be judged by the gospel. And if they have not embraced Christ as their savior, there's no other way because Jesus said, no one can come to the father except through me. So our answer to that will be no. 
so can i can i ask one more uh, in that case uh, the people who have not uh, like uh, the before jesus the jesus who have, when jesus has not um, came on this earth so in that case those people who have never heard about jesus so uh, so the uh, it means that everyone will go to hell the people who have never heard about jesus before jesus came yes ab absolutely jews i am not talking about the jewish jews but the other part of the world where, who have never heard about jesus in that case how how the god will judge mm. their soul so what we do know is uh, same from romans chapter 1 and 2 is that god had his own way to direct them so you know all of the, how many of the millions of people who lived to to direct them to himself right that was in romans 1 we read about the creation the, that god was revealing himself through creation romans 2 through the conscience he was drawing them so ultimately creation and conscience are two indicators that have been placed before every person to direct them to seek the true and living god so how he would judge people in the Old Testament before they actually heard the name of Jesus Christ, we don't know. But what we do know is he had given them two indicators to bring them to himself, point them to himself. And from then on, how that's going to match up with the gospel, I don't know. But what Paul is saying is from Romans 1 and Romans 2, he says, ultimately, everybody will be judged according to the gospel. How that's going to happen, I think we should just leave it to God. Uh, I, I, I don't know the details. Thank yeah. you, Pastor. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Thanks. Sir. Yeah. Okay. So we have already taken uh, 10 minutes into our next class. Um, uh, let's take a break and uh, we will get back uh, in 10 minutes uh, for our second class. I'm sorry for uh, going over time on this. Okay. Thank you.